Hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, we welcome to uh, everyone, all the panelists, as well as the attendees to the 19th Shokat Khanam Kelsen Symposium. We're going to be starting with the second session today, and it's going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be two talks on Ewing sarcoma, and the second part of the session is going to be highlighting on the COVID experience in, uh, in pediatric oncology, where we will have data presentation from different centers and followed by a panel discussion. So we're going to start with the first talk of this session, and it's going to be presented by Dr. Dave Hobin, who is a pediatric consultant uh, oncologist at Birmingham Children's Hospital. He's also the clinical lead there in the oncology, plus has got interest in palliative care, as well as he's the trial coordinator for Ewing, for the sarcomas, neuroblastomas, and the Hodgkin's lymphomas. So I'm going to ask Dr. Dave Hobin to unmute his mic and turn on his video and start share his screen and start with his presentation. Morning. Uh, thank Good morning. you so much. Uh, I'm going to now start to share my screen and hope that the technology works. Um, so uh, hopefully you can now see uh, a little introductory image, which, uh, as I say, thank you for the introduction. And also, again, another thank you um for the invitation to speak at, at your symposium um yes i'm a pediatric oncologist an adolescent oncologist i'm based in birmingham in the uk uh and out of birmingham children's hospital one of the uh largest uh, pediatric cancer centers in in the country um and uh you've asked me to talk about um ewing sarcoma in particular the frontline treatment of ewing sarcoma so uh, hopefully over the next half an hour, uh, we'll just uh, quickly revisit our clinical knowledge and understanding of Ewing sarcoma. Um, I'm then going to spend some time talking uh, about uh, the historical context really of the development of frontline treatment for Ewing's. Um, and that really sets the scene and allows us to understand really why we're doing what we're doing at the moment. Um, I am going to talk uh, about the role of high dose chemotherapy I'll touch also on uh, the role of radiotherapy in Ewing's sarcoma. But I guess ultimately what I'm doing is I'm really setting the scene here um, really for my old friend and colleague, Dr. Mars, who will be speaking after me uh, on, on the challenges of relapsed leukemia, um, uh, relapsed Ewing's, sorry, we've had leukemia already. Um, I guess I also have to concede at this point that I am a medical oncologist, I'm not a surgeon. Um, and so I really wasn't going to dedicate any uh, time um, talking about the surgical management of Ewing sarcoma. So apologies to anybody that is uh, uh, dialed in expecting to have a, a detailed conversation about the surgery because I, I won't be touching on that. So I guess uh, really just we're just on about 100 years now since um, this entity was described initially as an endothelioma of bone based on the on the morphological appearances of what um, was felt to be a, a vascular related tumor of bone and um, described by James Ewing after whom of course it was uh, subsequently named um, and back at that particular time of course uh, the only treatment options that were available for well any bone tumor to be honest uh, was that of amputation uh, and obviously the uh, that was had a poor outcome either way um james ewing initially when he described the first case described a teenage girl um and as i say had a particular appearance on the microscope but what struck him particularly uh, novel in this instance was the fact that this tumor seemed to be responsive to radiation exposure it just so happened it was a coincidental uh, at the time that radi radium treatment was being explored uh, in, in what it could be used for in, med in medical treatments. Um, and he just sort of almost stumbled across the fact that this was a radiation sensitive tumor, which has marked it out against osteosarcoma, the most common um, bone sarcoma that we see. Uh, but of course, we know a lot more of uh, that now uh, or about this tumor. And actually we also understand that this isn't a single entity. Uh, of course, and we now describe the so-called Ewing's families of tumours, which includes the classical Ewing's, but it includes uh, entities such as the eponymously named Askin's tumour, the, the chest wall, um, and we've got the uh, uh, malignant um, 
peripheral primitive neuroectodermal tumors, which you now know sit within this within this category. What we do also see now is we've got a, an increasing um, or a growing number of what we're calling atypical Ewing's uh, sarcomas. I think this is mainly driven now by um, increasing molecular characterization of these tumors. Oh, my apologies. Um, molecular characterization of these tumors. Um, uh, and again, we will be talking briefly about uh, the molecular elements of this uh, shortly. Um, we uh, know that, um, again, it's the second commonest um, malignant bone tumour um, affecting primarily the lower limb and pelvis. Um, this schematic tries to give you a bit of a description um, or a distribution of tumours. I should say at this point that the 16 percent, the, the chest wall tumours principally is, of course, derived from, from rib. The um, site of uh, the primary tumour um, does have an impact on uh, overall survival in Ewing sarcoma. This is something we will be coming back to um, as we go through the presentation, but you will also be familiar uh, with, with that uh, in, in its context. Um, about a quarter of our patients um, will present with metastatic disease. Um, and um, the course of the presence of metastases has a significant impact um, on overall survival. Um, and uh, again, uh, we know that the site of metast metastatic disease again impacts on overall survival with isolated pulmonary metast metastatic disease having a, a better outcome overall. Um, the outcome for those with multiple uh, metastatic diseases is particularly grim. Uh, and I certainly recall as a trainee being advised that those certainly with bone marrow disease um, were, were invariably, uh, is an invariably fatal situation. Um, however, this still remains a challenge in terms of, in terms of treatment. So here I've just tried to uh, give some basic figures uh, around um, survival in that context. Uh, and I present uh, uh, the um, Kaplan-Meier from the, the paper published uh, by Yi et al. Um, really just uh, helps us separate out the, the different survival with the different metastatic sites. The standards of diagnostics for Ewing's, um, well, uh, that's been reliant on detailed cross-sectional imaging, uh, uh, morphological and immunohistochemical characteristics that everybody will be familiar with. Uh, the comment really here is, is the role of FDG PET, and I think all of us are probably seeing an increasing use of FDG PET in terms of staging for Ewing sarcoma. Uh, and there's a growing body uh, of evidence that it's certainly more sensitive in detecting nodal and bony metastatic disease uh, than perhaps MRI alone or, or with technetium bone scan. Um, the, I've, I've included a, a, an image on the slide here, which just helps to underlie that. This is an FDG PET scan. <clears throat> excuse me, which shows uh, evidence of here of, of sadly a local recurrence uh, and also nodal uh, recurrence um, in Ewing sarcoma. Um, so again, uh, highlighting it, it, its effectiveness and its, its use as, as it grows in increasing popularity. I think uh, uh, there are certainly some challenges uh, for us in the UK in terms of accessing FDG PET for children. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what your own experience and practice is, uh, but often, um, as a result of that, we may consider using various MRI sequences, such as MRI STIR, as, a, as an option to, to look for distant metastatic uh, disease. Molecular diagnostics is well established now for Ewing's sarcoma. It is a growing field, <coughs> and um, we will all be very familiar um, with uh, the EWS FLY1 uh, as a key uh, determinant of uh, diagnosis of Ewing's. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about um, the molecular side in the next slide. <clears throat> Apologies if it looks busy. Um, I think the idea here is really not to um, uh, ask uh, or expect people to read this in detail, but uh, really just to get a flavor um, of, of what, what, uh, how complex I think uh, molecular elements of any uh, malignant disease is now. Um, so with the Ewing's family of tumors, um, uh, we uh, are very familiar with the uh, context or, or the, the, the concept rather of uh, EWS ETS gene fusions and uh, EWS FLY1 being 
by far and away the uh, commonest uh, fusion uh, that we see in Ewing sarcoma, but it's certainly by no means the only one. Uh, and certainly I've listed here um, uh, a number of, uh, of a number of variants of EWS translocation that have been reported. Um, of course, uh, this uh, leads uh, at its most basic level to uh, because it's a transcription factor, um, uh, results in upregulation of a series of uh, direct targets, uh, all of which are involved in um, cellular proliferation, promoting cellular pro proliferation and tumorigenesis. And of course, we do have a uh, concomitant uh, downregulation of a number of targets uh, identified in the red box here. Um, and all of these are uh, integral uh, or part of the whole apoptotic pathway. Um, equally, of course, this is just the direct uh, targets uh, of the aberrant transcription um, gene. Of course, there will be a number, a uh, myriad, uh, not, no less, of indirect targets, um, all of which really ultimately go on in participating in a, participate in a variety of complex pathways. Um, and this, is, this really here is just by way of an example uh, and not meant to be um, comprehensive. And there are now a small number of groups that have published and suggested that a pattern of gene expression uh, that you see in Ewing's may well have um, uh, or may well be an important prognostic marker, but I still, we still await that uh, in a more detailed format. Um, and certainly with the, the development and the application of next generation and whole genome sequencing, it potentially opens the door of a very complex milieu. Um, and of course, the, the hope is that out of that will become um, a whole uh, possibility of new therapies. Um, and this really, the final little uh, schematic on this particular slide tries to really give a very simplistic um, approach as to how we might think of um, impacting on these many different pathways um, specific for Ewing's in this example, but the, the basic principle, I suppose, applies across the board. Um, and you will see various ways. Um, this is very much focused on, on how we might potentially um, impact on the whole EWS fly one uh, pathway, um, but being the most common, of course, that we've just alluded to. And you might see here that there are some uh, drug names already <clears throat> appear here that you might recognize from other contexts. Uh, so again, uh, it will be interesting to see how this develops um, uh, over time with the new technologies and new understanding that we're constantly developing. So uh, in moving on now, uh, I'm going to bring the focus back uh, to what we see in the clinic presently um, and to perhaps take a moment to just understand the historical context um, and the development uh, of our treatment approach that we currently use. Uh, and in doing so, I think we have to acknowledge the importance, of course, of national and international collaborative groups in running clinical trials when these are uh, highlighted on this slide, um, but in no particular order or preference. Um, very early on in the uh, development of a chemotherapy strategy uh, for Ewing sarcoma, um, the combination of vincristine, doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide um, was, was noted um, very early on in some of the early trials, and this is indicated here by the, into the 70s, um, the importance of inclusion of anthracyclines such as doxorubicin um, was noted to improve survival significantly. Uh, this was noted by those early studies carried out by the North American group. We then see that uh, the addition of iphosphamide and etoposide is also confirmed by a number of groups uh, uh, to improve uh, overall survival. And what emerged out of that was really certainly for the European groups, the European consortia um, um, identified by ISIS and Euro Ewing um, was the regime that um, referred to as VIDE or VIDE um, uh, became standard uh, as an induction regime um, followed by consolidation therapy with a combination of uh, vincristine, actinomycin and cyclophosphamide. 
the actinomycin being recognized also very, very early on. In contrast, the North American uh, study groups, um, they developed a strategy that alternated um, the uh, vincristine dox and cyclo, the VDC uh, backbone uh, with uh, uh, IFOS and etoposide at three weekly intervals. Um, and you'll be all familiar with the, um, the study, the AEWS0031 study uh, run by COG, which uh, looked at the intensification of that um, particular uh, approach using trying to move towards uh, the uh, three comparing rather three weekly to two weekly with um, granulocyte stimulating uh, colony factor support um, and that demonstrated quite clearly that a, a compression or an intensification of a regime in terms of timing rather than drug doses resulted in an improved um, event-free survival uh, going up to 76% at two weekly uh, intervals compared to a 65% with a three weekly schedule. So we're now in a situation where we've moved uh, into, uh, and certainly uh, in the UK and uh, Europe, we've got the Euro Ewing's 2012 study, um, which really tried to compare and look at um, any differences between what I would call the standard European approach, which is the VIDE um, plus VAC uh, in comparison to the North American strategy that we've just alluded to, which is the compressed uh, Vink Dox Cyclo with IFOS and ETOP. Um, and what was uh, really interesting is that very quickly following the opening of the Euro Ewing's uh, 2012, an interim analysis of the data in early recruitment did in fact identify uh, that the compressed two weekly regime um, was certainly associated with less toxicity and was already uh, seeming to suggest that there could be a survival advantage. So we've taken ourselves really from a position uh, not that many decades ago of, of really quite uh, poor outcomes, certainly into a better position uh, that we are now, but this certainly applies. The 70% really is very much uh, focused uh, on a particular subset of um, patients with localized disease. So we can see that this pattern of uh, identifying an appropriate drug combination, um, moving to uh, the uh, change in the use of the pattern of those drugs and intensification of treatment. Um, and we're at a point now where um, we're, well, I'll talk at the end about where I think we may be heading to. Um, we've throughout this period of time, of course, been able to identify a number of risk factors for Ewing sarcoma. And we have looked at the value of the potential of high dose chemotherapy, which we're going to go on and talk about. So this really can summarizes where we are now. Uh, this is certainly the standard approach uh, that many of you will be familiar with, uh, with the sort of, uh, as I've said before uh, in the previous slide, uh, a standard um, approach with a compressed uh, two weekly 14 day schedule with these key component drugs. Um, as an induction uh, approach, we then get to the point of deciding on local therapy, uh, which we're going to talk about, um, and moving then on to uh, a, a period of consolidation, which is very much uh, brought, uh, developed through the risk stratification uh, or identifying certainly high risk patients following local therapy and deciding whether or not standard chemotherapy um, or high dose with autologous stem cell transplant is useful. At this point, it's worth mentioning um, about the role of uh, bisphosphonates. Um, I, again, this, this is an interesting one uh, in as much as that there's certainly uh, a lot of um, uh, in vivo um, uh, animal models or in vitro certainly uh, evidence that the uh, nitrogen containing bisphosphonates do have a cytotoxic effect. Um, on um, Ewing's family tumor, certainly cell lines have been identified and that that effect can sometimes be enhanced by exposure also to uh, alkylating agents. So the current Euro Ewing's 2012 is trying to explore this somewhat further um, and is uh, part of a randomized question 
um, in um, in the in that context or in that group of patients um, as they move into the consolidation phase of treatment. So uh, I'll spend a brief moment uh, talking about high dose uh, risk stratification first of all, and we'll then talk about high dose chemotherapy. Um, and I think basically. Um, when it comes to risk stratification, we've already touched on this. Uh, there is currently no um, internationally agreed risk stratification for Ewing sarcoma. And when you look at um, the different groups, uh, study groups over the years and what they've used, um, they've all been very different. So it's really difficult to make comparisons between, between different studies and trials. We all recognize that the presence of metastatic disease confers a, an inferior outcome. Um, and so that's certainly one group. Tumor volume is a difficult one because again, it's, it's one that's been used differently in different groups. Um, and currently in my practice in the European setting, um, it's uh, felt that um, tumor volumes of in excess of 200 mils uh, confer an inferior prognosis. Probably the biggest one that uh, we've evolved over time and understood better is the response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And many will be um, or very familiar with the presence uh, of viable tumour um, following uh, definitive local therapy. Usually a surgical resection were feasible um, as to being a particular uh, indicator of, of outcome. Uh, and we know that, um, of course, this is an impacted on surgery, which I'm not talking about, but the presence of central site tumours, um, again, also particularly uh, challenging. Um, uh, and can have an impact on uh, local relapse-free survival, which I've tried to indicate here with um, <clears throat> some basic uh, figures um, from, um, from uh, ISIS-92. Uh, so when it comes to uh, megatherapy or high-dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell transplant, um, not surprisingly, uh, as with other diseases that are, uh, have poor outcomes, and um, when one is moving to a, a sort of intensification of treatment, the role of this particular modality of treatment comes into question and is analysed. Um, and what we've learned with Ewing sarcoma particularly, um, through a number of different studies, is really in, even in metastatic disease, uh, the application, there is no benefit uh, to the use of uh, high dose chemotherapy, typically the combination of busulfan, busulfan and melphalan um, with an autologous stem cell transplant. Um, the uh, European groups have demonstrated that with isolated pulmonary metastases, uh, there is no added benefit to this uh, treatment approach. Um, and in fact, there's no survival difference if you receive high dose chemo compared to if you receive a standard um, chemotherapy consolidation, in this case with vincristine actinomycin iphosamide with whole lung irradiation. What um, there is, of course, is there is increasing uh, toxicity. And, and this was demonstrated in the Euro Ewing's 99 study that there were four uh, toxic deaths related to the exposure to busulfan and melphalan. So in the context of um, isolated pulmonary metastases at this stage, uh, uh, our approach is not to use um, high dose chemotherapy. Where there has been a, a, a demonstration of an improved uh, survival or survival benefit is in a very selected cases uh, of localized uh, Ewing sarcoma. And this rather complex table here tries to outline really our approach in the current European study in terms of uh, deciding who should be considered for uh, this modality of treatment. Of course, we have to bear in mind that because busulfan is included in this approach, there may be some contraindications to that, excuse me, based on exposure to previous radiation. Um, and I've summarized um, the contraindications that we currently look at. What you'll see here is effectively um, the, the, a number of uh, scenarios, if you like, 
uh, would be applicable to uh, the use of high dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell rescue. So I spend briefly a moment just to talk about radiotherapy. Um, and again, I, I think it's been interesting if you look historically at the use of radiotherapy, because it has been quite different in different study groups. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and uh, certainly very early on, there was a good recogni a recognition that involved field radiotherapy was sufficient for the treatment of Ewing sarcoma as opposed to whole bone compartment. Um, so, for example, if it was a proximal femoral or a distal femoral, you only need to irradiate the area of the bone rather than the whole, uh, the, the tumor rather than the whole whole bone. Of course, there's always been a nervousness about radiotherapy uh, in children, um, and particularly driven by the concerns over the long term impacts um, of, of um, radiation, and in particular the development of second malignancies. Um, <laughs> as a result of this, there was quite a difference in the use of uh, radiotherapy in Ewing sarcoma, and perhaps most starkly identified by the European study, ISIS-92, that showed quite a stark difference between uh, the German study group and the UK study group in the, in the use of radiotherapy. And that translated into quite a stark difference in survival. Whereas in the UK group, they uh, suggested that it was a 14% inferior five-year survival um, recruited to the UK. And I think that was principally due to the fact that there was very little <clears throat> use of radiotherapy um, up front in the, in the pre-operative setting. One of the things that marks out um, the, those early studies was the, the, particularly the GPO, the German group's um, use of pre-operative uh, radiation treatment uh, in Ewing sarcoma. <clears throat> um, that study also highlighted uh, one of the other benefits <coughs> was the use of a centralised forum um, to uh, discuss and determine the best approach to definitive local therapy for Ewing sarcoma. Um, and this is something that um, was translated certainly into the UK into the establishment of a national Ewing's multidisciplinary team forum, which really was focused on the discussion of local therapy. Where we are now, of course, is that we've got the role of proton beam radiotherapy. Uh, and I think this is, is really going to be watched with interest. Of course, the rationale for um, proton beam was because of the relatively spurring of uh, collateral tissue damage, but also um, the theoretical reduction in risk of late effects. Um, and certainly now um, in the UK, um, the significant proportion of uh, Ewing sarcoma patients will go on and receive preoperative proton beam radiotherapy. I don't think it's a panacea, however, uh, and of course this doesn't include patients with metastatic disease um, who wouldn't be eligible for protons in the UK. Um, in my own practice, uh, pro access to protons is somewhat limited. We have only one centre in the UK that delivers this form of treatment with a second centre coming online um, in, next year. Um, and we uh, do support some of our families going overseas, uh, specifically to a, a unit in Essen um, for the proton beam treatment. <clears throat> So, so um, Dr. Dave, you had to finish in the next couple of seconds. We yeah, are I have. I'm exactly on my last slide. OK, thank you. So, uh, so really where we are now, I, I think we have to uh, be we have to congratulate uh, ourselves and celebrate in some ways where we are. Um, we've definitely improved survival in a rare and aggressive disease. We have managed to understand some of the biology, but I still think we have some significant challenges uh, that I know are going to be discussed in the next one. In terms of further improvements in outcomes, I think in terms of classical or chemotherapy, I think we possibly have reached our limits. And so now it's all about knowing how we apply the biology, um, and in particular developing new agents and how we get rapid access uh, and robust testing of those new agents. I hope we've addressed all of those key objectives. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present to you uh, and talk to you today. Um, and I look forward to hearing uh, Dr. Mars's talk as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dave, for the precise uh, overview on the treatment. So our next uh, presenter is Dr. Atau Rahman Mars, 
who's a consultant pediatric oncologist plus the clinic uh, lead for pe uh, neuro oncology at Sidra Medical Center and is going to be talking about relapsed Ewing sarcoma. So Dr. Maz, I will request you to please uh, unmute your mic and share your screen with us. Right, Rabia, thank you very much for the invitation. And I am all set, except I am unable to share my screen. Just give me one second. Thank you so much, Rabia, and uh, the organization organizers for the symposium um, for uh, allowing me to speak on relapsed chewing sarcoma. A big disclaimer though, I claim no expertise, no particular expertise other than a head full of gray hair on uh, Ewing sarcoma. So what's new regarding relapse? Uh, you've heard a very comprehensive talk and please do not expect anything like what uh, Dr. Hoban, um, um, you know, the standard that Dr. Hoban uh, talked to. Um, I will try and cover uh, the, 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 the practical aspects, uh, hopefully. Next slide, please. So this is uh, Sidra Medicine, the hospital where I work in Doha. Um, I have to say this is a very well taken picture. Uh, moving on, um, I have no financial disclosures. And then the, um, a couple of uh, introductory slides, um, uh, I suppose. So uh, Ewing sarcoma is part of bone tumors, uh, which is uh, bone and soft tissue tumors, but in this context, it is um, bracketed within the bone tumors, which is about 5% of all childhood tumors. This is the uh, National Cancer Institute data from 2017-18. Next slide, please. When we talk of the outcome, um, um, I would like you to look at the, uh, the bar, uh, red bar in the middle of the, the, this graph. So the outcome, as Dave uh, pointed out, is roughly around 70%, uh, five, uh, five years um, uh, survival, overall survival. And that, it has to be said, belongs to um, a subset of patients, uh, as, we will, uh, as we learned in Dave's talk, and we will uh, see uh, a little bit further on. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just a few facts to start off. Um, one fourth of patients with localized disease representation will still relapse. So what we uh, know or what we perceive to be um, localized disease, there is still um, a ch um, about 25% chance that that disease will uh, relapse still. The reasons for that, micrometastatic disease and so on and so forth. Let's not go into that at this stage. Um, for those who have obvious metastatic disease at presentation, treatment failure rate is much, much higher of the order of between 50 and 80%. And for those unfortunate patients who do relapse in the end, the, uh, uh, the survival, long-term survival is uh, very low. And um, Unfortunately, there's no standard management for this group of patients as of now. There are guidelines, there are, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, protocols locally developed, but there is no internationally accepted <clears throat> um, standard of care. Uh, moving on. Thank you. So this is Euro Ewing 99 uh, data, a Kaplan-Meier curve from um, the uh, a large study, European study. This is the study that I grew up on when I was doing my oncology training. This was the clinical trial that we were enrolling children on. So this Kaplan-Meier curve compares the um, Ewing sarcoma flea one versus the others, but the point is not to show you that difference. The point is to point out that the average uh, of the two the survival is around 70% uh, in, the, in, in the whole uh, Ewing sarcoma um, group for the localized disease. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this is CCG 7881 and POG 8850 data, 
once again, the, the trial itself was looking at what Dave also showed as the combination of iphosphamide etoposide to the CVD bone, uh, uh, backbone. Uh, but again, the point is not to, to, to look at the, uh, the, the top bits of the graph. Uh, you can still see that the average is around 70% uh, event-free survival. But for the metastatic disease, we are still looking at around 20 to 30% event-free survival at five years. <clears throat> Moving on. So this is one of the slides that I had changed the order to. Can we go back two slides, please? Go up, to, sorry, not, not go back, go forward two slides. Yeah, and another, yeah. So uh, the prognostic factor, sorry, no, one slide, this one, this one, yes. So in terms of when you look at the prognostic factors at diagnosis, Dave uh, comprehensively mentioned that, but inevitably there had to be some overlap between the two talks. So when you present tumor size larger than eight centimeters or tumor volume of more than 200 mils was associated with a poorer event-free survival. Axial skeleton we know is associated with um, a poor outcome. Uh, histological response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, this is a much more uh, developed and a much more proven um, prognostic factor in recent years. Uh, talking about the surgical control, the local control, um, so marginal or intralesional intra surgery is certainly associated with the worst uh, event-free survival. Local control modality, conflicting evidence of superiority of surgery versus radiotherapy. On balance, uh, whichever modality you use, the, the, the overall, uh, in the, of course, in the appropriate setting, the, the overall survival is more or less the same with the modern um, uh, equipment and modern techniques. Um, age. Older age is associated with worse outcome, as you know, in the presence of metastatic disease. Site of metastatic disease also, we'll discuss it in the next slide that we talk about. And the uh, level of serum LDH has uh, probably some significance in, few, in, a, in a few studies if, you, um, if you're looking for um, you know, serum markers. So twice the level. Um, you know, would, would have an association with a, a worse outcome. Now, can we go back one slide, uh, Halima? Yeah. So on the Euro Ewing 99 data, they uh, looked at a multifactorial, uh, a multifactorial analysis was done. And then, um, you know, uh, the prognostic indicators were um, um, pointed out. So age less than 14 years, was certainly associated with a better outcome as opposed to age over 14 years. Tumor volume of less than 200 mils versus larger tumors. Sites of metastases and the number of, site, uh, number of uh, organ system involved uh, was definitely uh, prognostic. So the more organ systems involved, the more sites involved, the worse the prognosis. In terms of the bony disease only, uh, more than five lesions were associated with the worst prognosis and you know, uh, going uh, downwards. So less than um, two lesions were associated with the better prognosis. And when you compare bone, bony lesions as well as lung metastases, then of course, if you had lung metastases, you had a worse outcome. Now, based on this, they came up with a risk score, which um, intuitively, if you had a higher risk score of above five, you had the worst outcome. Now, can we go back one further slide, please? Uh, this is uh, Kaplan-Meier um, representation of the same things we talked about. Um, so this is age less than 14 years. This is uh, tumor volume less than 200 mils. And this is the number of um, um, organ systems involved with bone marrow metastases 
uh, obviously having uh, in as, as single bone marrow metastases had better outcome, but in combination with others, certainly um, worse outcome. Now we need to go uh, yeah, forward. Yeah, one further. Thank you. So talking about relapse now, those who do relapse, up until now, we've talked about the risk of relapse, but those who do relapse, the pattern that we see. So about 70% of um, children and young adults who have Ewing sarcoma and who relapse, relapse within the first two years of diagnosis, which is defined, which is the definition of early relapse. So, um, uh, and within that, the, um, those with, who had localized disease at the time of presentation, their median time to relapse is about 1.4 years. And those who have uh, metastatic disease, median time is about one year. Late relapse is defined as two to three years from diagnosis, and that's around 10 to 15%. And very late relapse, which is longer than three years disease-free interval, is about five to 10% of children who relapse after this long. In terms of the sites, about two thirds of um, uh, relapses occur in distant sites, um, including lungs and bones and others. Um, and about 20% have isolated local recurrence. As I said before, it occurs later than metastatic relapse. And uh, interestingly, 50% um, of relapses are diagnosed on surveillance imaging rather than recurrence of swelling or um, representation with symptoms. Next slide, please. So the prognostic indicators, um, um, isolated local recurrence has the best outcome amongst the um, relapsed patients. Normal LDH and good performance status has been associated. It's a weak association, but there is association with a better outcome. Younger age has a better outcome, again, 14 years being the cutoff point. And isolated pulmonary relapse, some series have reported a better outcome with that. The worst outcome is associated with uh, local as well as distant uh, relapses. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, what is the, the best prognostic indicator is the um, DFI or the disease-free interval. Um, so if you have a relapse um, over two years, uh, that is, you know, the late relapses have uh, an overall survival, five-year overall survival of about 30%, compared to uh, if you relapse within two years, i.e. early relapse, the, the um, overall survival is really dismal. And looking at the median survival, the early relapses or uh, within one year is the um, median time to, to, survive, to, to death is only three months, between one to two years is eight months, and if you relapse, over two, after later than two years, then the uh, survival is around, median survival is around two years. Next slide, please. And this is uh, um, data from um, uh, the uh, INT91 study um, that just shows the same thing as we've discussed before. If you relapse uh, two years or later, the uh, overall survival is around 40% um, compared to uh, less than 10% for those who relapse early. Next slide, please. So what do you do when a patient does relapse? Um, I suppose it's all intuitive and I don't need to tell this group how to go about this, but just a couple of thoughts to share. As I said before, 50% of relapses are diagnosed on surveillance imaging. And the surveillance imaging, I'm sure once again, all of you know that is carried out in the form of cross-sectional imaging. Um, in some cases, depending on where the tumor was with ultrasound and with plain X-rays. PET-CT has no role in surveillance. I hope the uh, audience will agree with me. And PET-CT is a staging investigation. 
It's not a surveillance uh, tool. In terms of biopsy, in the appropriate setting of Ewing sarcoma on surveillance with a risk of relapse uh, isn't really necessary. If there is a tumor, again, you will know uh, what tumor it is. However, it's gaining more traction because you can get further molecular uh, information if you uh, get um, more tissue and you can find targetable events. So biopsy, while not mandatory, is um, um, becoming more and more important as we enter into the era of molecular um, uh, treatment based on molecular work. The next slide, please. So uh, options of treatment. Um, I should have actually, in, in my most recent version, I changed this slide somewhat. So first of all, let's talk about the role of local control. And that role is only important if you've got local recurrence only. And that uh, then, um, you know, is important uh, and does and is associated with um, a better survival. On the other hand, a huge majority of your relapses will uh, be distant metastatic relapses. And for, for those, uh, the options of uh, treatment are chemotherapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, surgery and radiotherapy have less role to play as long as you're talking of uh, um, you know, curative or semi-curative uh, treatments rather than palliative measures alone. Next slide, please. So the most well-known study that, that is comparing uh, various um, uh, second line treatment options is the European um, uh, Recur uh, study. Um, in the table below, the top four of the treatment options um, outline uh, the, th those um, uh, treatment regimes which are being used in a randomized fashion. So there is no compulsion on using any one of those up front. You could be randomized to either one of them. However, um, uh, then you, uh, you know, it, it would be a comparison. For second line, third line, fourth line can still be used and you would still be randomizable if you um, are still on, on the trial and if the patient hasn't died. So there have been two, um, uh, interim analyses uh, so far. On the first interim analyses, gemcitabine and docetaxel uh, was uh, removed from the randomization because it had um, um, uh, 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 inferior survival. And the second um, 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 interim analysis looks at temozolomide, ironotecan versus the other two, and it seems that the uh, Timozolomide is coming as the inferior arm, although I think a lot more has to be said on that. Uh, the Timozolomide ironotecan is the best uh, studied arm and is so also associated with the uh, best response rate of the um, of these regimes. Um, so I think uh, um, that is what recur trial is about. We wait with bated breath when the eventual uh, results come out. The bottom two uh, regimes, either oral etoposide on its own or etoposide with a, a platinating agent uh, are also used with a response rate of the order of around 20 to 30%, uh, but quality of life consideration also um, are rather prohibitive um, by using the, 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 the top regime, the um, etoposide cisplatin. Oral etoposide can be used, but is the, uh, most, is the least favored of these regimes that I mentioned. Next slide, please. Um, now, um, a newer chemotherapy agent, ribulin is a microtubule uh, inhibitor, and it's been FDA approved for adult soft tissue sarcoma and has shown activity 
uh, in the mouse models of uh, Ewing sarcoma. Uh, it does um, um, it seem to have an impact and it's uh, undergoing uh, as a phase two trial as a single agent and also is being studied in a separate trial in combination with uh, iron or TCAM. Next slide, please. Uh, there are a couple of uh, interesting newer formulation of the agents that we already know about. Napaclitaxel is a nanoparticle albumin bound formulation of paclitaxel. The evidence comes from one, the preclinical pre uh, activity, but also from the previous experience of um, uh, taxanes in combination or alone com in combination with gemcitabine. Liposomal iron TCAN is also uh, has also shown to to have higher plasma concentrations. So, uh, in vivo activity in the xenografts have been demonstrated. So it's being studied alone as well as in combination with uh, cyclophosphamide. Um, not um, the the above three. I think are options to know about, but certainly I, I don't think they are. Uh, going to be in clinic uh, for pediatric population over the next um, three or four years, in my opinion, anyway. Um, next, please. So um, Dave uh, beautifully outlined the role of high-dose chemotherapy. So in the relapse setting, can I just uh, add my two bits um, very briefly? Um, so there have been several anecdotal reports of improved survival with high-dose chemotherapy, uh, and most commonly used combination is that of busulfan and melphalan. So yes, I have also uh, been in centers, certainly when we were training, there were a number of patients who were randomized to uh, this group. There are no prospective randomized studies in the relapsed setting. So that um, has to be kept in mind. There have been uh, retrospective analyses and those retrospective analyses have shown that outcome may be superior for those getting high dose chemotherapy, but as an independent outcome variable, it hasn't come out to be statistically significant. Now, another fact I would like you to kindly keep in mind is that patients who in the relapse setting get high-dose chemotherapy are a highly selected group. So you give high-dose chemotherapy to those who have shown radiological CR, right? So uh, by definition, they have a chemoresponsive disease. So that's number one selective group. So they, those patients are uh, those patients belong to, a, 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 if you like, a better uh, prognostic group. And also uh, the fact that you've got, um, that they've got a good performance status and adequate bone marrow reserve also puts them in a, in a better performance uh, group who are likely to do better anyway. So, so this is a little bit complicated. However, there is a slight improvement, uh, which is not uh, proven, I would say, and it's not suitable for all patients. Next slide, please. And this is uh, um, uh, the um, uh, 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 a graphic representation, the Kaplan-Meier curve, again, uh, showing what I said in uh, discussing the last slide, the outcome is probably better. However, uh, it's not statistically significant. Next slide, please. So moving on to the um, uh, modern era of targeted therapy, there are several targets identified as Dave uh, outlined. I wish I had such a beautiful slide uh, to take you back to, but uh, just to um, give you uh, some um, uh, targeted um, uh, therapy examples. Uh, first of all, the IGF receptor one is highly expressed in Ewing sarcoma cells and it drives tumor growth. So after once the genitumab was uh, uh, discovered and the, the uh, treatment was targeted, there was some initial success and very 
um, you know, there was a lot of excitement, but it hasn't been uh, sustained. Um, it is currently, uh, genitumab is being uh, studied in combination with uh, other co um, conventional chemotherapeutic agents. The PGF, placental growth factor, is associated with tumor invasiveness and metastatic potential of Ewing sarcoma. Uh, that is being studied. And the receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors, there are various uh, RTKIs in, uh, in trial phases, in trial phase. And the VEGFR inhibitor, uh, regorafenib, uh, um, has shown to have about 10% response rate, which is um, quite encouraging. Then um, cabozantinib, which is a MET protein inhibitor, is also uh, being uh, studied in recent um, early phase trials. Next slide, please. So um, PARP1, which is a DNA repair protein, uh, shows um, um, high expression in Ewing sarcoma. Um, the initial uh, trial with the PARP1 inhibitors has been disappointing, but now it's been studied in combination with other DNA damaging uh, agents. Um, next slide, please. So I think I'll leave this slide out. This is just uh, some selected uh, targeted therapy trials. Um, so we'll skip this trial, uh, sorry, skip, skip the slide. Um, and finally coming to um, immunotherapy. So um, we know that uh, the um, PDL uh, one uh, expression uh, in um, a lot of Ewing sarcoma cells. So what is PDL? Um, the immune system has the ability to, I'm sorry, I'm being disturbed here, just a second. Yeah, so the immune system has the ability to, um, 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 to identify uh, pathological cells, tumor cells as foreign and um, react against them and kill those cells. Those um, uh, reactions are um, uh, muted by various immune checkpoints, but blockade of immune checkpoints, then uh, by genetic modification of the um, uh, uh, tumor cells can um, lead to, um, you know, uh, down regulation of the Ewing sarcoma cells and up regulation of the, um, the, the immunity. Um, uh, the PDL, uh, uh, PDL1 and PD um, inhibitors are in wide practice at the moment, but they are in uh, trial stage. Um, and then immunotherapy with uh, tumor vaccines, uh, such as um, the Vigil paradigm. Um, so you harvest Ewing sarcoma cells and um, uh, uh, genetically modify uh, them with uh, GMCSF. Um, again, mounting the uh, anti-tumor response by the immune system um, through dendritic cells, but uh, down-regulating the uh, immunosuppressive effect. And by that, um, it, there are encouraging uh, results. An early trial uh, reported about one, uh, one year survival of 73% for the relapsed Ewing sarcoma compared to 23% of those who were treated with conventional uh, chemotherapy alone. So at the moment, there's a randomized trial going on comparing Tamiri, that at um, temozolomide and irinotecan versus uh, immunotherapy. So um, I come to the end of my um, presentation. In summary, um, about a quarter of patients with Ewing sarcoma um, uh, unfortunately relapsed, which is associated with a poor outlook. Um, the disease-free interval and the number of metastatic sites are most important prognostic indicator in the relapse setting. Isolate, isolated local relapse has better outcome and benefit of high-dose chemotherapy is improving. The newer targeted uh, 
uh, therapy and immune therapy options are becoming available. Uh, but cost implications and quality of life are important considerations, especially in um, countries with low or middle income. Um, thank you. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Maas, for the wonderful presentation. It does look like that Ewing sarcoma relapsing very early has got really poor outcomes. Uh, we are going to be uh, switching to the second part of our talk now. But before that, uh, there were a number of questions that were posted on the chat as well as in the QA. And Dr. Dave has kindly, I think, has answered most of them. So I would appreciate uh, while, while we go into the second part of the talk that if you can, if both of you, the speakers, will be able to answer those questions in the written because of the time constraints that we have here. So I'm going to thank you, Dr. Maas, as well as Dr. Dave Homan, for a wonderful uh, discussion on the Uving sarcoma and which you have both of you have concisely covered both the first line treatment as well as what to do in the relapse setting. So we're going to be switching to the second part of this session, which is uh, the COVID-19 uh, COVID experience in pediatric oncology in Pakistan. So there's going to be data presentation from four centers, and it's going to be roughly about three to four minutes. Uh, we, you're going to present your data, and then we'll have a panel discussion. So we're going to be presenting data from Shogat Hanam, Children's Hospital, Aakhan Hospital, and Indus Hospital. And then the panelists would include Dr. Halima Saeed, Dr. Muhammad Rafi Raza, he's from Indus Hospital, Hospital. Dr. Halima, everyone knows, works at Shokal Hanam Hospital. Dr. Ali Pesselsleem is a consultant pediatric infection control person, a specialist at Ahan Hospital, and Dr. Mavish Fizan, assistant Pro associate professor at Children's Hospital. So we're going to be starting with our first data presentation by Dr. Halima from Shokat Hanam. So I would ask Dr. Halima to please share her screen and start, please. Thank you. Okay. Are you guys able to hear me? Yes, Dr. Halima, I can hear okay. you. All right. Oh, okay, good. All I'm right. sure so everybody else can hear you too. Okay, so I will be like Dr. Rabia mentioned, we'll be looking at data from across Pakistan. And these are the centers that Rabia has already introduced that will all be sharing the data. There are only two cases from Islamabad and Multan. So I'll just include those in my uh, presentation. So I will be covering um, the cases that were seen at Shokat Hanim Hospital uh, between April and August uh, 2020. During this time, we had a total of 17 patients that tested positive uh, for COVID uh, by PCR. Um, the vast majority was either less than uh, five years or more than 10 years, with only three patients between being between five to 10 years of age. Uh, we did see a disproportionate number of males, the ratio being uh, 4.6, almost five to one of males versus females. Um, and the underlying diagnosis uh, was half and half between solid tumors and lymphoma and leukemia, which may actually just be the trend of malignancies that we see here rather than any predisposition uh, to um, uh, COVID. Uh, so the presenting symptoms, uh, so about five patients out of our 17 were asymptomatic. They were picked up when we, um, uh, you know, screened them either pre-surgery or pre-chemotherapy. And the most common symptom was fever in association with uh, other symptoms. Um, so 10 patients presented with fever. Um, the majority of them had associated cough or sore throat. Other symptoms that they uh, had were body aches, uh, uh, diarrhea, vomiting, and there was one patient that presented with fever only. There was one patient that had a cough and a sore throat without fever, and then there was one patient that had body aches and rash and did not have a fever. So there were very few that did not have fever. Uh, two patients had concurrent infections, and two patients had other comorbidities other than cancer, renal failure, and other comorbidities. Uh, in terms of the investigations that were done, uh, CRP was uh, uh, checked in seven and it was elevated in all seven, was not checked in the rest of the patients. Again, D-dimer was checked in four and was elevated in all four, not checked in the rest. Seven of our patients were neutropenic, again, related to chemotherapy, not related to COVID. Um, coagulation profile was checked in six patient and patients and it was normal in all six. Uh, chest x-ray was normal in five patients. There was a mediastinal mass in one patient, which was again disease related, not COVID related. And, and there were non-specific findings uh, in three patients. And again, it was not done in eight patients because they did not have 
respiratory symptoms. In terms of the treatment, um, 10 patients required hospitalization, uh, seven was, were treated as outpatient. Um, only four patients had an oxygen requirement. So even out of the ones that were admitted, majority did not require oxygen and only two patients I required uh, intensive care uh, admissions. In terms of outcome, we had one death that was related to COVID pneumonia. Um, uh, the rest were, you know, all uh, recovered. But in terms of the impact on the treatment for these patients, uh, there were those key chemotherapy delay and modification in eight patients, surgery was delayed in three patients, radiation was delayed in one patient, and there were only four patients that had no impact uh, on their therapy. Now, during this uh, time period, we also collected data on all the patients that were on active chemotherapy. So we had 261 patients that were on active chemotherapy during this time, and um, 103 of them had a delay in their chemotherapy. Nine had a, a delay in surgery due to hospital policy of obviously not taking COVID positive patients to the OR. Uh, three had a delay in radiation. And um, the most common external reason for delay in chemotherapy was just a non-availability of public transport where patients were unable to come to the hospital to receive chemotherapy even where we would have been able to give it. Uh, so this was an 89 out of the 261 um, patients. Um, so I put this slide in just to show that regardless of the small number of COVID patients and the low morbidity and mortality that we saw in that population, there's a huge impact on the active therapy patients. And as we follow these, we plan to follow this cohort prospectively, we'll see how their outcomes are affected by these delays in therapy, surgery, and radiation. Now, the two uh, patients that I was going to share, one is from Multan. Um, this was uh, shared by Dr. Zulfikar. They had a 15-year-old female with a diagnosis of leukemia who presented with a 15-day history of fever, also had cough, blood and sputum, and body aches for a week. Uh, there was bilateral Krebs and reduced air entry on exam, and she was pancytopenic. Coagulation profile was deranged, and she had, had elevated ESR and LDH. Her chest X-ray and CT showed bilateral airspace disease and mediastinal lymphadenopathy that was disease related and she died during the first week of uh, uh, therapy. And the second case that was shared with us from PIMS Islamabad was that of a one and a half year old male uh, with Wilms tumor stage three who was asymptomatic and his uh, he was just picked up on a PCR that was done preoperatively. He is not due for surgery that is being delayed by uh, two weeks. So um, I think the next center can share their data. I'm, I'm done with the SKM data. So the next presenter is going to be Dr. Maria from the Children's Hospital, Lahore. Please, Dr. Maria, can you share your screen and unmute your mic and the video, please? I'm Dr. Maria Sai, fellow pediatric hematology oncology, and I am presenting uh, data for COVID in Children's Hospital, Lahore. Uh, regarding data, we have uh, total screen patient that was 74 and uh, two patient comes out to be positive. Sorry, this is the data that uh, we totally screened 74 patients uh, um, uh, for uh, presenting to our department and three patients uh, which are suspected, two patients PCR was positive and one report is awaited. This is the split up data of this patient. We have that uh, one patient that was for less than five years of age and one uh, is uh, seven years and one was more than 10 years of age. Uh, there was two male patients and one female patient. And with the, uh, regard to diagnosis, one patient was suspected of LCH and one is a diagnosed case of APMS and one, is, one patient is uh, a suspected case of sarcoma. Uh, regarding symptoms, our patient with sarcoma is completely asymptomatic. He was diagnosed on uh, screening preoperatively. And uh, the other two patients who presented, they have uh, fever, uh, which is a common factor, and cough and respiratory distress. And both of these patients were very uh, become very sick within the period of 24 to 48 hours. And unfortunately, we uh, one patient is not uh, with us right now. Uh, study period, which is included in this, uh, it is from 1st April and uh, till date. A clinical presentation, that is the first case. It was a four-month-old uh, male child. He presented to us in August uh, with fever, cough, and respiratory distress. On examination, initially, he has lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenum galley, and his count showed a, a thrombocytopenia, and WBC count was higher than 80,000. Uh, we did the bone marrow examination in this child, which was normal, but he has lytic lesions on the scalp. Uh, lymph node and scalp biopsy was planned in this child, but he died 
before this uh, procedure because of septicemia and multi organ failure. Uh, these are the labs uh, which we done in this child, and he has abnormal. He has higher D dimers. CRP was increased. Coagulation profile was deranged, but he has neutrophilia in instead of neutropenia. Chest X-ray was abnormal, and uh, CT chest we couldn't do this in this child. And the second case was the 13 years old female child. She's a diagnosed case of AFDMS, and uh, uh, she has completed intensification and was in completed remission and due for maintenance therapy, uh, but she developed fever and cough distress that percent over a period of two and currently she is on ventilator in COVID ICU and her CT is done which is suggestive of COVID and we are uh, PCR is awaited which may be come at uh, today. Uh, these are the investigations. She also has uh, abnormal D-dimer, CRP, and deranged coagulation profile and neutropenia. Uh, chest X-ray is also uh, abnormal and CT chest showing COVID pneumonia, according to our radiologist. Uh, the other patient which presented, he is a five-year-old male. He presented with shoulder mass, but he was diagnosed at uh, COVID on screening. He remained asymptomatic. We didn't do any lab testing in this child. And currently, he, he was COVID PCR negative and staging workup is continued now. His mass biopsy and also other staging workup was delayed due to the COVID. Uh, these are the investigations which I already tell, but we, do, we didn't. We just keep this patient in home isolation and he remained perfect during this period. Uh, outcome that, that we have one death that was the unfortunate child, four month old child. Uh, he is, uh, died due to septicemia, DIC, and respiratory failure. And other complication, which are seeing in our other patient uh, the, the of APML, she developed AIDS now, and PCR is awaited. Uh, impact on chemotherapy regarding in, uh, chemotherapy, there was a significant delay because uh, uh, this uh, female patient of APML, she is due for maintenance therapy, but it is delayed. And um, surgery, it was delayed almost three, two to three weeks delay of uh, uh, that child who needs the bio surgical biopsy of this patient. And we couldn't apply the radiation delay because these patients, our patients don't need any uh, um, radiation and uh, no impact was not noted. These are the data from the Children's Hospital Lahore. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Maria. So our next talk is uh, our next data presentation is from Aachen University and Dr. Javeria will be presenting the data to us. So Dr. Javeria, if you can unmute your mic and your video and share your screen with us, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. Can Dr. Maria uh, unshare her screen? Yes, ma'am. I just stop sharing. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can screen uh, see your screen. You just need to do the slideshow. Okay, thank you. And we uh, can hear you. Yes. So this is the uh, data from AKU. Uh, total number of COVID-19 positive pediatric oncology patients that we had here were 15. Uh, uh, from April to October 2020. This is uh, just to show that uh, from uh, the earliest one, the earliest positive patient we got was in April and the latest one was in October. Uh, if we look at gender wise, uh, the male to female males were 53%, females were 46.6%. So the most common age in our data uh, is more than 10 years age range and the most common diagnosis that we uh, had in uh, is leukemia and then the second most common is uh, are the patients with solid tumors. Uh, most of these patients were on chemotherapy uh, in uh, around 33.3% uh, like five of these 15 patients were on induction and uh, 10, four were on maintenance and six were on uh, like from solid tumors or other categories. Clinical presentation, the most, most of them, like five uh, were asymptomatic, 33.3%. Uh, fever was the presentation in another five, 
the combination of these like fever and cough or fever and sore throat in four of them uh, three of these children have concurrent other infections two 12 were uh, not having any other uh, any other concurrent infection again three of these 15 patients had comorbidities 12 had none imaging was done in uh, chest x ray was done in 10 patients ct scan in two and the abnormalities were seen only in uh, two of the patients nc was less than 500 in four of the patients from 500 to 1500 in three of these patients and more than 1500 in eight of the patient uh, while well, uh, the lymphocyte count was less than 500 in three of the patients ranging from 500 to 1500 in five of these patients and more than 1500 in seven of the patients uh, crp was not done in 10 of the patients uh, it was high in four of the patients uh d dimer was also not done in majority of the patients and in whom it was done six of them had a, a high d dimer coagulation profile was not done in eight of these patients uh it was deranged in only three and was normal in four eight of these 15 uh covid positive patients were admitted in hospital and among these majority were only uh, on supportive treatment and only two had admission in the icu the total duration of hospital stay was less than one week for four among uh, these eight admitted patients and more than one week like the longest stay for one of the patients was 33 days uh impact of on a treatment interruption of chemo or modification of the treatment was done in 11 of these uh, 15 patients and uh, the uh, delay in start of the chemo of more than one week was seen in three more than two weeks in eight patient uh, one patient had delay in surgery and one patient had delay in uh, starting of the radiation therapy because of this uh well uh, among these 15 patients if we see outcome at, thir- uh, at 30 days two patient were expired one of them because of covid pneumonia and one of them because of progression of the primary disease thank you uh, thank you dr maria so our last data is going to be presented from the indus hospital by dr rafi raza so dr rafi if you can unmute your mic and your video and share your screen with us please thank you rabia for uh, meeting me for this uh, data presentation i think you can uh, see my screen yes we can see your screen you just need to do the slide show of your presentation this is from uh, indus hospital pediatric oncology unit uh we had a total screen patient uh, between uh, may to uh, August 2020, 2020, uh, it was uh, 538 patients were screened, and out of which uh, 72 patients were positive. That means 30, 13% positivity rate. And uh, these were the patient characteristics: uh, age less than five years was 32%, and almost similar percentage between five to ten, and more than ten was 40%. gender mainly uh, males 57% and uh, leukemia lymphoma was the uh, main uh, uh, disease category uh, almost two third and one third were solid tumors and among the clinical presentation one fourth of the patients they were asymptomatic and they were picked up during uh, routine screening either for admission or for surgery and uh, it is important to point out that initially we were doing just a screening of patients who are having symptoms but later on we changed our policy and then we were screening every patient who is being admitted as inpatient or he was undergoing any uh, radiology or radiological procedures or he was undergoing a surgery so in this way they were picked up and fever 
was the main predominant symptom in 58%, cough in 15%, sore throat and body pains uh, in a few percent of the patients, while other symptoms uh, were in 51% patients. And this was the uh, contact tracing. How uh, we picked up these admission screening in 22%. Uh, Retesting was then in four. Admission for chemo 17%. Febrile neutropenia patient were presenting. They were 18%. Workup patients uh, newly diagnosed. They were 33% and came positive during admission. That, while that is, they were uh, admitted in the ward and any procedure like we planned, and then when we repeated the test, it was positive. And acute gastroenteritis uh, presenting presentation in 1.4%. Duration of stay, uh, mean duration was uh, six days, and the median was four days with a wide range. And these were the comorbids, like one patient had uh, an end heart disease, and other had chronic, uh, uh, he had a pulmonary tuberculosis. These were the investigation performed. Neutropenia uh, was seen in 37% of the patients. And uh, while 19 had neutrophilia, absolute lymphocyte count was raised in 69%. It was low in 24%. And uh, D-dimer uh, was uh, performed in 5%. Uh, in, uh, and it, it was abnormal in 5% of the patients, while normal in 2%. Uh, CRP which was abnormal in 6% and coagulation profile was abnormal in 11% of the patients. Chest X-ray was abnormal in 21% while it was normal in 20, in 37% of the patients. This was uh, the hospitalization uh, in uh, 23%, 23 patients were hospitalized while 49% were not hospitalized and uh, during hospitalization, six uh, patients required oxygen, while uh, 17 didn't require. And uh, out of uh, 23 patients, two required ICU uh, care, while 21 uh, was managed either in HDU. And uh, so 9% were admitted in ICU and 91% were admitted in uh, COVID unit without ventilatory support. Azithromycin was given to four patients, while one patient required uh, remdesivir. This is the outcome. Total number of deaths among the cohort were, were five, that is 7%. And COVID-related death was only one. He, he, that patient had COVID pneumonia, while disease-related death, like one patient had uh, hyperleukocytosis, and when on, at admission, we did uh, his uh, COVID, he was, he was positive, but during stay in COVID unit, uh, he had intracranial bleed that was confirmed by CT scan, and that was probably due to hyperleukocytosis. Two patients uh, were on palliation, and uh, they expired after uh, the uh, COVID negative, and treatment-related death was one, that ch child had uh, neonatal, uh, he had febrile neutropenia, and uh, he became COVID negative, but uh, after shifting from uh, COVID unit, he expired later on as inpatient. This is the impact on treatment. Chemotherapy delay uh, and our modification was done in 57% of the patients. Uh, treatment as planned was continued 17%. Surgery delay was seen in 3% and uh, radiation delay was in 3%. Left uh, against medical advice, abandonment was 7%. And that was when uh, the patient came to know that uh, his child is COVID positive and when they were asked to get admitted, they got uh, uh, left against medical advice. And 5% of the patients were referred uh, to uh, other COVID unit due to uh, unavailability of beds. So there was a, a huge impact on the uh, management of uh, these uh, pediatric oncology patients. Thank you for uh, listening.
Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Rafi. And I would like to thank everyone else for presenting their data. So we're now going to open up for the panel discussion. As I've already mentioned, we've got four uh, doctors who is going to be a part of the panel discussion. So I would request all the attendees, if they've got any questions, to please post it in the Q&A box. So uh, I'm going to start first by asking Dr. Ali, who's the infection control, pediatric infection control specialist at Aghan Hospital. We're 10 months down in the pandemic. And given the data that has been presented from the different centers, it's heartening to know that not uh, most of our kids or, or these patients are asymptomatic. Now, we also face this problem that because of any, sur any elective surgery, they do a COVID testing and they are mostly those patients are asymptomatic, but because of the COVID and because of the hospital policy that they have to be in an isolation for about 10 to 15 days, we are delaying their surgeries. So do we actually need to do that? for these patients because it's a, it's a, treating cancer you, is more Rabi, important. Thank you, Dr. Rabi. It's a million dollar question, what to do and at that situation. But I think uh, the most important thing is like uh, how much the exposure can happen if you do that surgery in terms of uh, in terms of general anesthesia and the child is positive. So you have exposure to staff and exposure to other patient. So that's possibility. So in terms of uh, asking what is the best practices I would say uh, it's it's always you need to measure your risk and benefit, and if you have a theater which which can provide you a negative pressure area, so better to do not delay the procedure and get the procedure in negative pressure area. We have this uh, pro problem at Aachen University as well, and we really need to work hard. At least take two months to work uh, to develop a small area where we can do a surgical procedure in terms of negative pressure. So I would say delaying is a tactic. It's not delaying in terms of therapy, in terms of therapeutics, but in terms of safety precautions to the other patient. The, so over the period of time, it's, it's a learning environment. So, you know, like in 10 months, we, we learn a lot and we continue to learn in the second phase and probably for the future as well. So, so if, I, if, you, if you ask me to summarize that, so it's, you need to weigh in terms of risk versus benefit, how your institute can have the areas where you can put them in, in a separate environment, uh, risk to the therapy and risk to the procedure, they're always there. And you need to, and each of the institute have to measure it before taking any of the decision. That could be different from Children's Hospital Lahore, that could be different from Shokat Khanam and the other institute across the Pakistan, over. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ali. So we've got a question from Dr. Sagir, and uh, his question is, what is the strategy at all the centers who presented the data regarding the screening of caregivers for admitted patients and also about testing for day case and chemo procedures? So I will request Dr. Rafi Raza to answer this question followed by Dr. Halima and Dr. Mavish. Thank you, Rabia. Uh for caregivers, uh, uh, the patient, where there was uh, exposure uh, to the uh, patient, uh, they were screened, as well as uh, the whenever there was a patient uh, that uh, came turned out to be positive while doing stay in the unit, that uh, staff was also screened, as well as uh, the patients who were nearby in that uh, uh, room, they were also screened. So that was for the uh, uh, fish, uh, caregiver and uh, uh, attendant uh, and staff uh, screening. Dr. Halima. Sure. So uh, at Shrak Khanam, we don't have a policy regarding uh, caregiver uh, uh, or attendant screening. Uh, so essentially, patients that were positive, uh, while they were admitted, the caregivers are, were, are asked to stay in the room with the patient and not leave uh, leave the room or go to the cafeteria or anywhere else, but they are not screened. Um, and ones that were discharged, they're given instructions written as well as verbal on how to self-isolate at home for 14 days. So we have not been screening the uh, uh, attendance for patients. And in terms of admitted patients, uh, we are only screening preoperative patients or patients prior to leukemia therapy, induction patients. Other than that, we are only testing for um, uh, symptomatic patients where we have suspected COVID, that is where we do. And I saw a question in the chat about what test has been used. We're doing nasal swabs, nasopharyngeal swabs, and we're doing PCR. Dr. Maria. 
Yeah, thank you, Rabia. Uh, as far as the screening is concerned at the Children Hospital Lahore, uh, I hope you are able to hear me. Yeah? Yes, uh, we can. Uh, regarding the patients, we are not like, uh, routinely screening each and every patient. We do screen the patients who are symptomatic, and we do screen like pre-surgery if he has to go for a uh, procedure the, like lymph node biopsy. And uh, regarding the caregiver, the caregivers are not routinely screened, but if the child is so unwell that he needs admission, uh, in the COVID unit, and then we screen uh, the attendants who are supposed to stay with the attendant. And secondly, uh, uh, the rest of the uh, for the patients like who we are sending home and who are asymptomatic, uh, we don't sc uh, screen the caregivers. We do advise them to get them screened, but it's like not done as a part of our hospital protocol. Okay. And what about Aga Khan hospitals? So, Dr. Ali, would you like to answer? Yes. So, what we do is we encourage uh, attendant to screen their test. Because that's extremely important. Uh, as as the person is come out to be positive, which is asymptomatic, there is a possibility that he, the person can lead to uh, the uh, the virus to the other children in the hospital. Uh, because once this his child come out to be negative and go into the ward, there is a possibility that that attendant can transmit the disease if he's positive to the other attendant, the other patients as well. Because you know, like in a ward, there are five patients. So I think in terms of hospital infection control, we encourage people to do that. We really respect if somebody come out to be negative, we really respect that. And we always encourage to do that. Sometimes it's a positive case. So we really ask to, to, uh, to have one attendant to strict and do not move around. And before the test come out to be negative, the person is not moved that. So I think policy here we have is like, we encourage to do that. Uh, for the positive one, we exactly asked to do that. And uh, because the possibility of the other patient who are in the ward, if this person come out to be positive is high and transmission can be happy in terms of surface and respiratory both. Over. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Rafi, there is a, a question from one of the, from Dr. Mary Taj about the positive 13% yeah. positivity rate. So any explanation for that? Yeah, yeah. basically we were, uh... Yes, just I uh, just I told in my presentation that initially we were just screening uh, in the initial days only patients who were having symptoms. Then when we started performing tests on every patient who was presenting to us uh, for uh, admission for any kind of uh, like a radiology procedure or a CT scan MRI, so we increased screening and the number of tests you can see uh, performed during from May to August, they were a lot. So in that way, we picked many asymptomatic patients also who are not having any symptoms. So that's why our positivity rate is around 13%. And I think similar percentages are seen in other children also who are not you know, compromised like uh, other uh, children uh, other uh, with other diseases okay thank you very much so dr shamville has posted the short term effects of covid 19 the major impact he's fearing is the is scared to particularly to new patients so uh, regarding the registration of new patients so what where are we at that so i will ask dr javeria from Khan. i mean how has this impacted their registration of their patients in pediatric oncology uh, uh, what we have seen here is uh, regarding the first, first I will answer regarding the screening of our patients. Uh, we screened all the symptomatic symptomatic patients plus uh, asymptomatic patients, oncology patients who had to go uh, undergo any procedure or for radiation or any new patients who were uh, to be admitted in ward uh, because other patients uh, they were of obviously immunosuppressed, so we had to screen a new child uh, before getting him admitted in the ward with other immunosuppressed children. So uh, the impact on the uh, diagnosis of new patients or uh, uh, registration of new patients, we haven't seen uh, any uh, reduced number. There was like the oncology ward was working on full capacity during all these COVID months. Okay, so while while you're we, on, we had seen we had seen a huge impact on number of registration. Our number of registration per month of, is 
100 plus, like we see 100, 110 new patients every month before COVID. And uh, from March, if we see like in March and April, in, in from, from 24th March, uh, lockdown was there. And in April, our number of registration dropped from 100 plus to only 25. And uh, when gradually lockdown was uh, slow, uh, was relaxed, then in May and June, the number of registration gradually increased to 45, then uh, 55. So uh, during lockdown, a lot of patients were uh, 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 in the home, at homes. And, uh, and when the lockdown was relaxed, the patients were coming with, with high hyperleukocytosis and advanced disease. That, that was also seen. Previously, uh, hyperleukocytosis was there, but not in, in such percentage. So we are also collecting that data that how much hyperleukocytosis was increased during, after uh, COVID and after lockdown was uh, relaxed. So there was a huge impact on number of registration. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Najma, you would like to say something. So can you please unmute your mic? You need to unmute your mic, Dr. Najma, we can't hear you. So during the March and April, when the initial days of the COVID, there was a significant drop in the new diagnosis. Uh, and for the two months, we were not taking any new admissions. Uh, later on, we start taking, and now we are uh, getting increased number of the new patients with a huge burden of the disease. Most of them are presenting with a metastatic disease or usually with a history of uh, three to four months of the diagnosis and they were just waiting uh, for the acceptance. Okay, thank you. So the next question, I will direct to it to you, Dr. Halima. So what is the strategy for retesting patients who are positive on initial screening, especially before performing any surgical procedure? Uh, so uh, we are not retesting asymptomatic patients. So as long as they're afebrile and um, uh, asymptomatic, uh, there's a, a two-week wait period. So once you test positive for this is for the asymptomatic patients, obviously. Once they test positive, we delay the surgery by two weeks. And uh, after that, we um, perform the surgery without retesting. So I would like, I would be interesting to know what Dr. Mavish, you are doing at Children's Hospital. We do retest, and if the child is symptomatic, the retesting is done after 10 days of being asymptom, uh, of being uh, like from the start of the symptoms. And then uh, obviously in the, we are in a healthcare setting and we repeat the testing at 24 hours. And if the two tests are negative, then we declare it as it's like a negative test. And uh, similarly, we, and we adopt the same for the uh, asymptomatic patients and the same approach is adapted for even the healthcare worker, the doctors who are working in our area. Okay. So the next question for you, Dr. Rafi, uh, this, uh, what about the pediatric oncology staff and team members who are getting affected? Did someone adopt smaller shift approach during the peak times? Uh, number of staff being affected. If we <clears throat> see um, most of the staff which were uh, infected, they were uh, getting infection from the homes, from the other members, are from the community. And uh, if we see uh, uh, very few, very few number of staff are uh, getting infection from the hospital. So uh, there was no change in the policy of uh, reducing the number of hours for the uh, COVID staff. So, and, uh, but uh, like there was one 12 hour uh, shift duty and then uh, they were given uh, 30 hours rest time, uh, 40, 48 hours rest time, two days they were uh, off. So that was the strategy being adopted. Okay, and what about Dr. Javeria in our Khan Hospital? Ma'am, yes. Uh, Ma'am, here, uh, uh, like in this, uh, the duty hours were same, but for the residents, the strategy was a little bit different, like uh, weekly two residents were assigned in the area and they did alternate calls and then uh, they get a one week uh, period at home and then two uh, new residents uh, would do the calls in between. So like it was a one week uh, free period for them and then uh, like alternate weeks there to come to ward. Okay, thank you. So I've got another question from uh, Dr. Yasser Hussain. What other communicable diseases are being screened before surgery and on operation and how false positives, how are false 
on how are false positives dealt? So I will ask Dr. Halima to answer this question and then Dr. Ali to comment on this. Uh, so uh, we are not routinely screening for any other infectious disease uh, prior to that. It's only because of the pandemic and to reduce the spread of COVID to the hospital um, staff and, and the surgeons and the OR staff uh, that the COVID screening is being done, but we're not routinely screening for any other uh, viruses. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yes, and I agree with Dr. Halima that you really don't need to screen for other communicable diseases. Uh, in terms of false uh, positive, so what we really need to understand is that anytime we do a uh, PCR testing, um, it is positive 70% uh, of the population. 30% who are still there, they, they come out to be negative. That's one thing. The second thing is like, uh, which is actually a gray area here is that if a person is asymptomatic and test is positive, it does not mean the person has the virus. It may be the virus is dead because we are checking the RNA of the virus in the PCR testing. The virus can be dead, but the person is still positive because the dead virus or the dead RNA was there. So I would say that again, um, in, the, in the oncology patient, because the testing rates, uh, the testing positivity is high and also the the comorbidities um, may lead to high or bad outcome. There's always an important thing to get these, these, these patients for retesting, particularly those who come out to be positive and asymptomatic. However, those children who come out to be positive but asymptomatic, only one test is enough uh, for, for, for negative thing, over. Okay, yes. thank you. And I'll uh, just add there that at the beginning of the pandemic, we were retesting for a while. Uh, and then exactly the same thing happened that there were a lot of false positives on the retesting. And that's why we, uh, you know, went to just using the two week uh, cutoff uh, for asymptomatic patients. So I think there's another question regarding the over the event free survival and overall survival on cancer patients. Is this regards to COVID-19 impact? Dr. Mehmoodi, you're asking, is that your, what your question is or is that regards to the Ewing sarcoma? So with regards to the overall survival on or the event free survival due to COVID or due to COVID-19. So Dr. Javeria, would you like to answer this? I'm sorry, what is the question? So the question is, uh, this is one of our colleagues from uh, Ethiopia and they're asking what are the so they have log logistic challenges to cancer patients because of the COVID. And they, they, he's asking if we have looked at the event free survival or overall survival on the cancer patients in this regard. We have just discussed the impact of COVID on the treatment. What are the over, what are the, what are the long-term outcomes? Actually, uh, I don't Which think- Which is a bit too early to say, yeah. Yes, too early to say, because uh, this is going to be uh, uh, continuous study sort of thing because we haven't yet we ha yet to discover what are the long-term effect so may, may i can add here dr rabia so yes. yeah I, I think the data which has presented by the institutes that show a little bit promising in terms of that very few children who has covid positive and have a bad disease die so overall you see that that in, in our institute a lot of kids go to icu but survive and get get them back. Uh, not of not all the children who has negative D diaper or positive D diaper, they survive well. So overall, I would say it's a usually the bad disease and ANC count and other prognostic factor which lead down to the children rather than COVID itself. So in terms of like you 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 know that if you have an ALL patient and an AML patient, you exactly know what the diagnosis can end up. So it's a bad disease rather than COVID itself. That is what we know right now. But as the days progress, as the data has come up and we lump up and pull up the data, we have better knowledge in the future about this thing. Over. Okay. Thank you very much. On, yes, Dr. Mavish. Uh, yeah, uh, right now we're talking about the direct effect of the COVID on the patient, mortality or on the patient, but there is an indirect effect of the uh, COVID on the patient management too. Like right now we are seeing a number of patients who are sort of who interrupted their treatment in the middle and obviously indirectly their like uh, the, the prognosis is going to be affected further. So there is a direct effect on COVID which we need to actually see uh, obviously after seeing the more number of patients and but the indirectly patient care and outcome is also adversely affected. 
Okay, thank you. So we are one o'clock. We are finished with our session. I would like to thank everyone, uh, especially uh, all the data presenters as well as the panelists for the interesting discussion we had. And I would also like to thank Dr. Dave and Dr. Maz who, who have kindly stayed with us throughout the whole session. So thank you very much. Uh, we're going to be taking a lunch break for an hour and at two o'clock, we're going to be starting our session three. So we hope to see everyone then at one o'clock, uh, two o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.